This program contains dramatic reenactments and material that may be disturbing to some audience members. Viewer discretion is advised. Taking a walk in the woods is one thing. Taking a trek in the Amazon rainforest is another. When three adventurers realize they are lost in the jungle, they soon discover that in the Amazon, there are a thousand ways to die. Yo, Shane! Don't leave me! There's gonna be fish food prepared for you. Searching for a way out becomes the ultimate fight for survival. <laughs> Struggling to stay alive pushes each man to his <laughs> limit. Yo, Who survives and how they do it on I Shouldn't Be Alive. Sariamas, a remote outpost in the Bolivian jungle. Tourists rarely find their way here, but it seems to pop up on the maps of adventurous backpackers. It's exactly the kind of place you'd expect to find photographer and outdoorsman Kevin Gale. He lives in Oregon, but he's been traveling the world for years. This guy's considered a legend on the adventure trails of South America. Well, I went to South America um, primarily to enjoy nature. My motivation was to just travel about from Colombia to Patagonia, back and forth, and uh, to do as much hiking or treks into nature as I could. Yasi Ginsberg is a few years younger than Kevin and a little in awe of him. But Yasi's got some life experience yeah. under his belt. He's just gotten out of the Israeli military. The reason why I came to South America was one reason. It was very clear to me. I wanted a, an adventure. I was very, very naive, bright-eyed, open to the world. Everything is possible. Traveling with Kevin and Yossi is Marcus Stamm from Switzerland. He just got dumped by his girlfriend, and he's hoping a little adventure will be a good distraction. Marcus and I had been... Uh great friends. We'd been traveling off and on together for eight months, and we got along famously. These guys are all open to adventure, so when a charismatic Austrian and self-proclaimed jungle guide Karl Ruprechta offers to lead them to a remote Indian village, they listen spellbound. Oh, lousy map. No detail, the whole of Bolivia in one map. See that? That's where we are now. We cross the Tuichi River. We cut the trail for four days, and we end up at the village. And then, you see the real Indians. It's an enticing offer, and one that's hard for these guys to pass up. There was an X with a pen. Carl said, the Indians are there. He told us that he'd been in the jungle numerous times. He was an expert in the jungle. So I had no reason to, to doubt his word. The locals warned them not to go. The beginning of the rainy season is just a few days away, and everyone knows that that makes the rainforest a dangerous place to be. But Carl convinces them he knows what he's doing, so off they go. It was a different world, and we could hear animal life all over the place. <laughs> Monkeys were howling, screaming. It was like a picture. The guys pack light. They're not worried about finding sources of fresh water in a rainforest, and they intend to forage the jungle for fruit and bird eggs. For meat, they'll hunt animals. It's a great plan, in theory. All we have is rice, beans, and salt. That's all, the rest comes from the jungle. But what we kill is not so pleasant. To the pot! To the pot! It's gruesome. 
and God waves it in the end and screaming and you see the wilderness in his eyes is a his element. He loves it. You killed it. You've murdered it. You can't do that. What? There's no law here. This is Bolivia. Yeah. You take care of him. You don't eat well tonight, Kevin. Hey, Marcus, pick up my gun. Marcus is shattered, you know, this, this helpless animal. How could you kill it like that? And he refused to eat. And Kevin is really upset with him because he's losing weight. And, you know, you need to nourish yourself. But Marcus would, wouldn't bring himself to eat. We were in the jungle. We were in this environment. And those things happen. And he was just oversensitive about everything. Five days in, and there's still no sign of the Indian village. Yasi and Kevin are having no problem adapting to life in the jungle, but Marcus is becoming a drag. We became all tougher, but Marcus. Marcus, what's going on with you? Let go of me, I'm okay. Why don't you just turn around and go back? What do you mean? You're not enjoying this. I guess you're just not cut out for the jungle. Day seven, still no village in sight. The guys are now thinking they should have listened to the locals who warned them that in the Amazon, there are only two seasons, the rainy season and the very rainy season. Marcus, getting weaker from lack of food, lags behind. He's also whining about his feet, going on about how they're killing him. He wasn't comfortable walking. That was the main uh, problem. He said it's tremendous pain. We didn't believe him. He's always finding a reason to complain. But when Marcus takes off his boots, it's clear to the others that he has a real problem. This, you gotta be careful with this. See the sauce? It will all open up to get in the end, and you've got no skin left. And your feet are kaput. After seven days of slogging through the wet jungle, Marcus's feet have developed trench foot, open sores that are home to some ugly fungal and bacterial infections. He's been on his feet so long that his body is having trouble getting blood with antibodies that could fight the infections to them. In short, his feet are rotting away. He needs medical attention, and he needs it fast. Guys, I'm sorry. Marcus should rest. One of you could go now with me to make contact with the village and then come back from Marcus. The village. It's said three or four days, Max, to get there. It's been more than a week now. Marcus could be here for days. Hey, you don't believe me? You think I don't know where it is, huh? Nobody's leaving anybody behind. It wasn't fair to Marcos to continue. I wanted to continue. If Marcos hadn't been there, I would have continued. It wouldn't, there's no question about that. So, what do we do, huh? From where they are now, there are two ways out of the jungle. They can stay on land and hike a little over 15 miles upriver, or they can take a more dangerous route and raft downstream about 93 miles to a known settlement. At the time, they don't think which way they decide to go will end up being a life or death decision. Bolivian Amazon has proven that it is no place to be caught unprepared. Because of the dampness of the jungle, Marcus has developed infected feet. He's down for the count, so the group reluctantly makes the decision to head back out of the jungle. They decide to take the river route out. Unlike Kevin, who has a lot of rafting experience, Carl, the group's jungle guide, isn't as skilled on the water. Left! Left! Go left! What left? Easy call good line. Good line. On the river, Kevin saw immediately that Carl is no authority. It was ridiculous, because Carl didn't know how to swim. Carl didn't know what he was doing in the raft. And I, I let him know. I told him that he was doing everything backwards. Hey, you listen to me. We do OK. Carl, nobody's going to drown. I think we are OK. So now, there was like fighting on the raft. They were fighting, because Carl said, you know, we have to pull to the left. And Kevin said, nonsense. We have to go to the other side. Come on, pull you. Carl would scream and curse. Don't listen to me, look what happens, huh? Crazy, on a river like that, you know, like no cooperation, no friendship. It was hell. 
and now Carl stopped us on the right bank of on the river. It wasn't any special reason. He said, "Let's rest for a while." But actually, once we landed on the right bank, it was planned. It wasn't just a let's stop for a second and refresh. No, he planned it. I I know he planned it. Back on dry land, Carl reasserts his authority. He has no intention of taking to the river again. We're pretty close to the canyon. Huh? You got to forget the raft now. Look, we are here. Almost the Cape Town River. It's Mel Paso San Pedro Falls. He called us and he said, "Down from here, it's a canyon, and there's no way. If you're going in, you're dying. There's no way out of it." So two days on the river and you've had enough, huh? You don't believe me. We gotta walk now. You understand me, Kevin? Look, we walk around the canyon. We stay close to the river. A few k further on, there's a small mining village, Curie Playa. Curie Playa is halfway to San Jose. We get to San Jose, you're as good as home. But Kevin knows about the falls, and he has a plan. He also knows that Carl wants to stay off the river. All we have to do is approach San Pedro Falls, stop, hike around, and then continue. I mean, think about it, Yossi. Why did we come on this trip in the first place? Carl promised us an Indian village, which was supposed to be the highlight of the whole thing. We never saw it. Was it ever there? All we have left now is rafting on the river. And no way is Marcus coming. I was very upset because. My dream, you know, to make contact with the Indians, my, that dream was gone, and you know, it was mainly because of Marcus. Kevin and Yasi stop listening to Carl. They don't want to give up on the great adventure. They want to pit their skills against some dangerous rapids. The others can return safely on foot. We could do it. We could go it alone. I chose Kevin, you know. Like I, in that split, I chose Kevin. He was my man, so I stuck with him. You're not coming, Marcus. Why? Because we're going back on the river. I know where you're going, Kevin. Well, then you know you can't come. Why? Your feet would be worse on the river. Kevin, my feet are okay. This is different. You're not coming. So this is it. Yeah, I guess it is. I felt Marcos was in a very bad place, bad spot. I certainly didn't want to hurt him. I didn't want him to make him feel worse. But and I, I didn't, couldn't help the guy. I mean, my best buddy, and I couldn't help him. In retrospective, how did we do that? How, how can you split in such an environment? You know. Let's get moving. I see you soon, Carl. Ah, you'll see. The aventura. <laughs> Still haven't had enough, huh? You're full of it, Kevin. There's gonna be fish food to pair you. Marcus and Carl head back into the jungle. Walking up river should get them to the nearest village in a little more than a week. The friends believe they'll reunite soon enough. After packing a survival bag, Kevin and Yasi take to the river. Kevin has been shooting the rapids for years, so he's having a fine time. But Yasi's not quite as excited or confident. The thought of rough water is a little scary. This is November already. We knew we are in the midst of the rainy season. Going into this river, I mean, it was suicidal. Almost immediately, we entered a series of roller coaster waves. It was a different river. All right, get it that straight. 
Go. Keep the time in my rhythm. That's good. I don't know you. Hard your side. Battle hard. It's becoming much more intense. You know, like the river is getting narrow, the water swifter. Certainly it was a bad decision to continue. That was a major uh, mistake. We were just shooting straight into white water. Both of us were lying on the raft. That was the only thing we could do. Suddenly, it was clear to me that nothing that can prevent us from colliding is this huge rock that was approaching. That's what happened, you hit the rock. The raft ends up pinned against the rock in the middle of the river, balancing precariously by the weight of the water. Any second, it could take a deadly drop. I saw, for the first time, I saw the fear in his eyes. And I was shocked because he was my rock. Kevin and Yossi hang on for their lives. All right, Yossi, I want you to listen to me now, okay? We can't stay here. All right? So I'm gonna jump, okay? I'm gonna swim to the shore. I'm gonna throw you a line. I don't want him to jump. And I, I, he tells me why he's jumping, and his plan is completely suicidal. He, not only that it's suicidal, he, he kills me. Kevin, no! Kevin! Despite the treacherous currents that threaten to pull Kevin under, he makes it to the edge of the riverbank and scrambles up the rocks. Kevin, don't leave it! All right, Yoshi, throw me the shoes and the machete! I saw the raft teetering. It was back and forth on the, on the rock. And I knew it was going to enter the rapids any second. Now hold it there, Yoshi. Just hold it there! At the same time, the raft moves, and I hear that terrible screech. Mass of water just stopped. Yoshi, hold on! He entered the rapids, and I saw him go through two or three rapids, a couple drops, and around the bend he went, and I didn't see him again. Yasi is swept away by currents traveling at about 10 feet per second and is dragged under the water. Like huge pressure on my chest. And I can feel, I can feel that, you know, like the power of the river. I'm shooting at such a high speed and deep, deep under the water. So it's like the pressure surmounts. I cannot breathe. I feel this is it. I'm exploding. I'm dying. And I knew this is my end. Yasi is being pushed to the bottom by the force of the rushing water. As he fights to hold his breath, waste gases in his bloodstream are building up, on the verge of triggering a reflex reaction that will force Yasi to breathe out, no matter how hard he tries to hold in his last gulp of air. After a long time in the river, I was spat again into the surface. It's the that, that most precious breath of air I ever took in my life. And that terrible Kenya was behind me. How did I pass it? I just don't know. I just have no understanding of it, but I was on the other side. The current has carried Yasi so far down the river that two miles of rugged canyon now separate him from Kevin. As Kevin works his way down river, Yasi struggles back up the canyon towards him. They both make it through their first night alone. The next day, neither gives up the search for the other. You know, jumping from one rock to another, looking around, and then suddenly I hear this scratch, this metallic scratch. And behind the rock, there's a small pool in the middle there. The backpack is waiting. It was a good bit of luck finding the survival bag. It had kept afloat by Kevin's simple trick of tying empty cans to it. When Kevin made this bag, he said, give me everything important to you, because this is the life bag. 
he tied two empty things to have it flow. The bag contains survival items, a cigarette lighter, a waterproof poncho, insect repellent. There's also a few ounces of rice, and perhaps most important of all, the map. Now Yasi can find his way back to civilization. I put the backpack on my back, and now with a new spirit, I climbed up thinking that it's gonna be easy now. Kevin and I get together, and it's gonna be over. We've got the equipment. It's gonna be a good story. Kevin continues to search for Yasi. He has nothing but the clothes on his back. He should have at least had the machete. Hindsight can prove to be a tough lesson. Later that day, probably after maybe four or five hours of hiking, I realized that I'd left the machete in the, in the sand. And I was very upset with myself. I had one tool and I had managed to leave it. I really felt stupid. So I thought for a second, but I realized that it was four or five hours back at least, and then another five hours back to where I was, so I was losing basically a day and a half. And I decided against it. So I pushed on. Kevin heads downstream towards Yasi, but the canyon walls narrow and force him away from the river and up to higher ground. I knew that the San Pedro Falls was before me, and I wasn't about to, uh, to swim through that. So I decided to leave the water and hike into the jungle. The chances of Yasi and Kevin finding one another are getting slimmer by the hour. And to make matters worse, Kevin now has trench foot too. Like Marcus's, his feet are rotting away from constantly being wet. Yossi! When you're lost in the jungle, they say the nights are the worst. They're full of unfamiliar sounds. For Yasi, they are waking nightmares. That night, the fear was so big that every minute, every little thing I'll hear, I'll just jump and I'll start looking around to make sure there's no animal coming. One night, a new sound really freaks him out. I just clearly heard some branch breaking. Something is moving. I'm, I knew I'm not imagining that something is moving near me. I look with the flashlight around, but the moment I put the beam on, I see the face of a jaguar. This cat is one of the jungle's most fearsome predators. If it attacks Yasi, it can kill him in an instant with a single bite to the back of the head. I had a cigarette lighter and I had a can of repellent. And I remember that I saw that in a movie that you can actually set the repellent on fire. flame died and there was no jaguar you know like I, I managed to scare him I sat there for the, the rest of the night and you know I started crying and screaming and trembling it was consuming that that fear The following morning, Yasi gets it together and realizes that he really is on his own. I just realized, I knew it, Kevin. Something happened to Kevin. I took the map out and I started studying it. Suddenly, I remember Carl told us about some camp, the gold mining camp, about four days away, up river. 
góry Playa. Góry Playa. So now I had like an idea. I have to walk and looking at the map, it was very hard to work it out. But I thought within two, three, four days maximum, I'm making it to the camp. And once I made it to the camp, I'll have a trail to follow and I'll make it out. With a bit of food and some fresh water in the backpack, Yasi presses on. You might say giddy with optimism. And here I am singing out loud, my chest open and fully trusting I'm going to make it. Then I suddenly discover a tree and I saw clearly it was actually cut with a machete. Kevin? And then it all makes sense to me. Actually, Kevin was doing the same thing. That was, in you, I would be trying to go to Kuri Playa. So I'm sure Kevin is there before me. I kept on walking along that trail. It started being a bit strange because the marks weren't as clear as before. And then after hours, I see this footprint. It's not an old footprint. I see that footprint in the mud and I realize this is a hiking boot and there's only one person in the world that could have left that footprint. Kevin! Then it dawns on Yasi that the tracks are not Kevin's, but his own. He's been wandering in circles for hours. And Kevin, he's still out in the jungle and he's not doing well. He's weak from hunger and about to crash. By this point, I realized my chances were very, 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 very minimal. After five days without food, Kevin's body has gone into survival mode, using up energy reserves stored in his fat cells. But it's using them up so fast, it's also burning up muscle as well. In an effort to survive, his body is actually eating itself to death. I was no longer thinking about Yossi, I was thinking about my life. I didn't have anything left. So now I was trying to save my life. And uh, that's what I did. After hours in the river, Kevin's condition is critical. He's barely conscious and starting to hallucinate. He can no longer tell if what he sees in front of his eyes is real. All of a sudden, I see a canoe. So I let go of the branch I'd been holding on to, and I began swimming towards the shore. They asked uh, two, uh, two questions. They asked me if I was lost, and they asked me if I was hungry. It was kind of funny. They told me that they, they went hunting in this area twice a year. I mean, it's literally one in a million. It's just pure luck. But Yasi's luck is running out. Yes! It's December in the Bolivian rainforest. And as Yasi is about to find out, not the place you want to be. High above the jungle, hot, moisture-laden air gathers into massive storm clouds. We're not talking about heavy rains. We're talking torrential downpours and the arrival of the rainy season with a vengeance. Swollen rivers of the Amazon burst their banks, and in the middle of it all is Yasi. By the time I understood, it was too late. It was a flood, and the river rose.
By morning, the flash flood is over. Yasi is washed far away from the river, his lifeline and route to possible rescue. It was the 15th day of my solitude. I couldn't start a fire, there was no sun to dry, and no food, and the rain, and wet. But things were clear. I just had to stand on my feet and keep on walking. But I knew now there's one, one thing, find the river. A few days after being found and recovering from his ordeal, Kevin makes his way to a Bolivian army airbase and tries to convince them to mount a search for Yasi. Si él fuera tu hijo, o tu hermano, ¿por qué no te a los Estados Unidos, donde tu familia? A pasar las fiestas navideñas. Pero hay una persona perdida en la selva. I had been saved, but I, I didn't know if Yossi was alive. I just had this feeling that Yossi wouldn't give up. Eventually, Kevin succeeds in convincing the Bolivians to take him up in a spotter plane to search for Yossi. I hear that noise, and I listen to the noise because it's so foreign, and I start realizing it's an airplane. It's a, it's a plane after me. I know it's Kevin there. And I'm just jumping on my feet and I'm running and I'm screaming. Kevin! Kevin! I'm here! What do Fat chance. Yasi is hidden beneath a dense jungle canopy. The odds of Kevin seeing him are zero. It was just uh, oblivious to me. I just collapsed. And the realization was, I don't want to live anymore. What I want is to rest. And the only way that I can rest is by dying. Not knowing he's only two miles from Yasi, Kevin now believes his air search is probably pointless. I realized we couldn't see much. And I asked him to fly lower and he wouldn't. He said it was too dangerous. And on top of that, he wasn't following the contour of the river. I didn't have a chance to find Yossi this way. I was going crazy. And every day that passed, I knew it was another day that Yossi's chances were diminished. They were getting smaller and smaller. It's been three days since the flash floods. The only food Yasi can find to eat are raw bird eggs and rotten fruit off the forest floor. He's running a fever and is weak with starvation. I was famined, I was diseased, I was injured and weak. I started realizing that I don't know what's going on anymore. I'm, maybe I'm, 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 I'm becoming insane. Despite the futility of the air search, Kevin refuses to give up looking for Yasi. He gets a local to take him back into the jungle by boat. And I found a fellow named Tico, and I asked him if he could take me up there to Ichi. And he told me that he can, but he has to be back within three days. So it's better than nothing, so I said, fine. Yasi is barely hanging on. He has no strength left to continue, but resting on the ground proves to be a dangerous mistake. Something bit me, it was a strong bite, and I can feel it's like an ant. And then another bite, and then another bite. Leafcutter soldier ants swarm over Yasi's body. They're not poisonous, but their scissor action jaws, powerful enough to cut through leather, rip off shreds of Yasi's skin. There can be up to 8 million leafcutter ants living in a single colony. And there were like hundreds of them, and then thousands of them, and I couldn't escape. There was no way I could escape. But the, the worst horror was the ray of light hitting 
a red carpet, you know, like everything around me. Five, six meters around me everywhere. It was all red and moving. We gotta walk now. You understand me, Kevin? Kevin, don't leave me! Yes, Back on the river, Kevin keeps searching for Yasi and pushes his guide on. I told him that I want to go as high as possible, up the river as, as much as possible. I just kept going up and up and up. I didn't want to stop. The jungle is just the jungle. weren't fit anymore, they were like two lumps, two chunks of blood and pus. I gave up. I prayed to God, just allow me to die. All I want is to rest, let me die. Podemos seguir. Mira, el río está creciendo de nuevo. El rápido es arriba. Siento. Aquí podemos seguir. I knew that was it for Yossi. It would take weeks, if not a month, to get back to the jungle. And there's no way that he could survive another month in the jungle. And I just felt this this heavy, heavy, heavy feeling and this uh, sense of loss and this terrible sense of guilt that I caused his death. Yasi is now so weak that the smallest movement takes all of his energy. I clearly heard a buzz, like a, like a bee or a wasp, and it's like coming closer, and I can start hearing it circulating my, my head. So, you know, I'm already in like the, the zone of like delirium. I'm just trying to get rid of that wasp and the buzz is in my ears, and as I raise my head and there's no... I don't see that there was, but when I turn my head, I see shades and people. It's like at that stage, I'm not, I, I don't know what's going on. Just, you know, like Kevin, like a flesh is already there and I'm collapsing in his arms and we just hold each other and hold each other. It's now it's just emotion. We cry and cry and cry. I couldn't believe it that, that we'd found him. If he would have been upstream, 
just a hundred yards away, he wouldn't have heard heard us. We wouldn't we wouldn't have seen him. <laughs> my life was spared. Uh, I mean, I know Kevin saved my life, but it was a miracle. For sure, it was a miracle. I think that Yossi saved my life, because if, if uh, we hadn't found him, if he, if he would have perished in the jungle, I would have had a very heavy burden to bear, knowing that I caused his death. Because I put him in the situation, and I was, I was entirely responsible. So I think that's how I see it. What started out as an exciting expedition over a month earlier for three guys looking for adventure and one perhaps deranged but definitely persuasive guide became a 20-day survival odyssey for Kevin and Yossi. They are stunned to learn the fate of Marcus and Carl, who they assumed had walked out of the jungle safely. It was a shock to us to discover that there was no trace of Marcus or Carl. Of course, when I realized that, that Marcus was lost in the jungle, it was a very, uh, very heavy feeling. Kevin went back into the rainforest immediately to search for them, and he couldn't find anything, any sign, any track. So it just evaporated. The Bolivian army also mount a search and discover that the Indian village that Carl marked on the map did not exist. Over the next few years, both Kevin and Yasi undertake searches for Marcus and Carl, but no sign of them is ever found. I don't feel guilt about not taking Marcus with us. Then and even now, I feel that it was the right decision not to allow him to come. But I always thought then, and I probably do occasionally now, that if I would have gone back with, with Carl and Marcos, if we would have gone back together, that it would have ended differently. We were thinking that what we are doing is more dangerous, if this is an excuse. We, we were thinking that. Still, we made that decision for him and he never came back. Kevin continues to photograph nature and enjoy traveling. He met his wife Orna while on the rescue mission for Marcus. They now live on a kibbutz in Israel with their two sons. Yasi Ginsberg is a writer and motivational speaker and works to preserve the Amazonian jungle. He lives in the rainforest of New South Wales, Australia. Thank you.